Welcome back to part two of activation functions and convolutional neural networks. Deep learning is like a component of a bigger system. Now we want to continue talking about the activation functions and the new ones used in deep learning. One of the most famous examples is the rectified linear unit, the ReLU. Now the ReLU we already encountered and the idea is simply to set the negative half space to zero and the positive half space to x. This then results in derivatives of one for the entire positive half space and zero everywhere else. So this is very nice because this way we get a good generalization due to the piecewise linearity. There's a significant speed up. The function can be evaluated very quickly because we don't need the exponential functions that are typically a bit slow on the implementation side. And we don't have this vanishing gradient problem because we have really large areas of high values for the derivative of this function. Still a drawback is it's not zero centered. Yeah? This has not been solved with the rectified linear unit. However, this ReLUs, they were a big step forward. And with ReLUs, you could, for the first time, build deeper networks. And with deeper networks, I mean networks that have more hidden layers than three. Typically in classical machine learning, neural networks were limited to approximately three layers because already at this point you get the vanishing gradient problem and the lower layers never seen any of the gradient and therefore never updated their weights. So ReLUs enabled the, the training of deep nets without unsupervised pre-training. You could already build deep nets, but you had to do unsupervised pre-training. And here you could train from scratch directly just putting your data in, which was a big step forward. And also the implementation is very easy because the first derivative is one if the unit is activated and just zero otherwise. So there's no second order effect. One problem still remains the dying relus because if you have weight biases trained to yield negative results for X, then you simply always end up with a zero derivative and the ReLU always performs a zero output, and this means then that the ReLU no longer contributes to your training process during the feature space. So it simply stops at this point. So no updates are possible because of the zero derivative, and this precious ReLU is suddenly always zero and can no longer be trained. This is also quite frequently happening if you have a too high learning rate here. So you may want to be careful with too high learning rates, and there's a couple of ways out of this, which we will discuss in the next couple of videos. One way to alleviate the problem is already using not just the ReLU, but something that is called leaky ReLU or parametric ReLU. And the approach here is that you not set the negative half space to zero, but you set it to a scaled small number. So you take alpha times x and you set alpha to be a small number then you have a very similar effect as the relu but you don't end up with the dying relu problem because the derivative is never zero but it's alpha and for the leaky relu alpha is typically set to values like 0 0.01 the parametric relu is a further extension and here you make alpha a trainable parameter so you can actually learn for every activation function, how large alpha should be. And this is then called prelu. There's also exponential linear units. And here the idea is that you find for the negative half space, a smooth function that slowly decays. And you can see here, we set it to alpha times exponent of x minus one. And this then results in the derivatives of one and alpha exponent x. So also an interesting way to get a saturating effect here. So we have no vanishing gradient and it also reduces the shift in activations because we can get also negative output values. If you choose this variant of the exponential linear unit, you add an additional scaling lambda. And if you have inputs with zero mean and unit variance, you can choose alpha and lambda with these two values as reported here, and they will preserve a zero mean and unit variance. So the CELU also gets rid of the problem of the internal covariate shift. So it's an alternative variant of ReLU, 
And the nice property is that if you have this zero mean unit variance inputs, then it will remain in the same scale and you don't have the co internal covariate shift. Another thing that we can do about internal covariate shift is batch normalization. And this is something that we'll talk about in a couple of videos. Okay, what other activation functions? There is max out and that learns the activation function. There is radio basis functions that can be employed. There is a soft plus, which is a logarithm of one plus the e to the power of x that was found to be less efficient than ReLU. This is actually getting ridiculous, isn't it? So what should we use now? People even went this far that they were trying to find the optimal activation function. And they used a reinforcement learning search in order to find them. We'll talk about reinforcement learning in a later lecture. And we'll just summarize the results here. One problem in this reinforcement learning type of setup is that it's computationally very expensive because in every step of the reinforcement learning procedure, you have to train an entire network from scratch. Then you basically ha have um, solved all the problems, at least all the solvable problems. So you need a supercomputer to do something like this. And searching for activation functions is a paper, reference six, and that was published by Google already in 2017. And uh, they actually did this. So the strategy was to define a search space, then perform the search using a recurrent neural network with reinforcement learning. And in the end, they want to use the best result and then repeat the procedure. The search space that they used is that they put in X into some unary functions. Then these unary functions were combined using a binary core unit. And this could then be merged again unary uh, with another instance of x that was then really produced to the final output using a binary function. So this is essentially the search space that they went through. And uh, they, of course, took this kind of uh, modeling because you can explain a lot of the typical activation functions like sigma eight and so on using this kind of expressions. So what can we see? These are activation functions that they found useful. So we, we can't do the procedure ourselves, but we can of course look at the results that they found. And here are some examples. And interestingly, you can see that some of the results that they produced resulted even no longer in convex functions. So very interesting results that they got. One general result that they came up with is that complicated activation functions generally didn't perform very well. They found something that is x times sigmoid beta x, which they call the swish function. So this seemed to be performing quite well. And actually, this function that they identified using the search has already been proposed before as sigmoid weighted linear unit in reference number seven. So let's look into the results in detail. And now a disclaimer. Never show tables in your slides. Try to find hard to find a better representation. However, we did not find a better representation. But what I can show you here is these are the top one accuracies that they have obtained. And this was done in an Inception ResNet v2 architecture trained on ImageNet. And in the third row from the bottom, you see the results with the ReLU. And then the bottom two rows show the results with swish one and swish. Now the question that you want to ask is, are these changes actually significant? So significance means that you compute the probability of the observation to be a result of randomness. And you want to make sure that the result that you're reporting is not random. In this entire chain of processing, we have random initialization. We have a lot of steps that may have been introduced by sampling errors and so on. So you really want to make sure that the result is not random. And therefore, we have significance tests. And if you look very closely, you see that these changes that are reported here, none of them are actually significant. So far, that hasn't really held up on other data sets. 
And therefore, our recommendation is go to the Relu. They work really well. And if you have some problems, uh, you can choose to use batch normalization, which we'll talk about in one of the next videos. Another interesting thing are these scaled exponential linear units because they have these uh, self-adaptation properties. So this is really attractive. But try Relu first. This is really typically the way you want to go. The search for the best activation function is a difficult, expensive optimization problem which has not led us to much better activation functions. So what we already have here is sufficient for most of your problems. So what we do know about good activation functions is what we know from our observations so far. They have almost linear areas to prevent vanishing gradients. They have saturating areas to provide nonlinearity and they should be monotonic. This is really useful for our optimization. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. So this already brings us to the preview on the next lecture. In the next lecture, we really want to go towards convolutional neural networks and see into the tricks how we can reduce the number of connections and also the number of parameters for building really deep networks. So I hope you liked this video. and. Looking forward to see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.